Good morning. Welcome here. My name is Murray. Glad to be here as we journey through this little New Testament book of First Peter. And you'll be able to find an outline, actually, of today's message. It'll be on your take-home sheet that you would have hopefully received on your way in here. So if you're on the back side of that, there should be an outline. And I think because we're not going to just walk through it kind of just verse by verse, um, you may find it really helpful just to, to look at that outline, follow along. You kind of know a little bit where we're, we're headed that way. Um, also, if you would like a Bible to... Um, Follow along with us as well. There's still a couple Bibles here on the table, so you can just come down here. Just feel free to grab one of those Bibles. Uh, You'll be able to find 1 Peter right near the very end of your Bible. It's very near the end of the the Bible, so if you start on the back end and you can work your way forward, you'll come through the Revelation, great little book. We did a study on it. I think you can find the messages online for the Revelation, but then you'll eventually get to 1 and 2 Peter. You might pass them by if you flip to it too fast, but check the table of contents. You can get your page number. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you just to take one of those Bibles and just take it home with you. It's our gift to you. We'd love you to read it. Then you can take more time to find this little book of 1 Peter and read it from beginning to end. And I think it has much there for any one of us. And really, we've been looking at how Peter, as he started this this letter off, um, he's really been pushing our hearts, um, really pushing the gospel really into our hearts, just trying to center our hearts on that gospel so that we can live out our gospel identity as servants, really just to imaging forth our servant king, uh, Jesus, who is the ultimate servant, and then we can live lives in submission, in service. And in today's example, Peter's actually going to zoom in on marriage. And why cover this topic? I mean, especially when so many of you are single. Isn't that kind of dangerous? Some of you might actually want to go out and start applying this text to your life on Monday, and that might be a little rash. But because we journey through books of the Bible, we want to learn everything that God has for us. And so it's not a matter of what I want to teach on, but we simply walk through books of the Bible so we get to be here to hear what God wants to teach us on. And so there are always principles as well that transcend the specific examples that that we look at. And also, some of you who are single, uh, you may be married one day. Some of you may be married in a few weeks. Okay, not mentioning any names, Tim, but um, others of you who have, uh, maybe you have broken marriages or you're divorced, and you may actually struggle more with this passage than the singles. And that's because you may have even a more distorted view of of marriage, and that's especially going to happen if you tend to look through marriage through the life of your memories or your experience rather than through the lens of Scripture. But marriage is not something a group of Neanderthals uh, thought up around a cave fire. In fact, it actually didn't even evolve out of human thinking at all. But marriage is something that God invented God designed marriage actually for his purpose and glory. And so I do find it interesting, though, that, that most passages on marriage in the Bible seem to directly follow passages that, um, that talk about the need to be filled by the Spirit. Coincidence? I think not. And I think the other thing we do need to say right off the bat is that I've only got 40 minutes, so there's going to be a lot of things, both in this passage and about marriage, that we're just not going to have time to really unfold or to say. So there's going to be a lot of things you'll notice that are left unsaid. But I do pray that as we come to this passage, you come with a readiness to really hear what God has to say to you in particular this morning, uh, not your spouse. And so what I'd like to do, even before we begin, I'd like you to just take a moment just to pray. I want to ask, have you ask God to just fill you with his spirit so that you can truly, really be open to receive his teaching. And so if you are here with your spouse, what I'd like you to do, guys, if you could just grab your wife's hands, and I want you to pray, and I want you to pray specifically for your own heart. Wives, you can pray for your own heart. And if you're single or not with your spouse, um, uh, what you can do is just hold Jesus' hand. And just pray for you that you would just uh, ask him to just to help you to really hear and then to really live out what he's got for you in particular. Would you just take 30 seconds just to pray for your heart before we dig into this passage?
So Lord, help us. Give us ears to hear. Um, we need this word. We may not think we need this word, but we need, we need a word from you, Lord. So help us. Ready our hearts to receive the truth that you would have for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let's have our scripture video where we've reached 1 Peter chapter 3 and then the first seven verses. You can follow along in your app or your Bible or we'll also have the scripture on the screen. Reading from the first epistle of Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. What I told you last week when we preached on submission to authority, that I couldn't imagine a more unpopular topic, I lied. <laughs> this would be a more unpopular topic. And this ribbon that I've got here to uh, mark my spot in this passage uh, may as well be a wick because it's leading me really into a powder keg. But I do think that this passage really is incredibly misunderstood, abused. And so I'm going to just try my best to unfold what, what I uh, see Peter is really trying to, to get at. But I know wherever I land. I mean, whether I land over here or whether I land over here, some of you are going to start looking at me like I'm kind of a piñata. In fact, some of you are even resisting, and I haven't even started. But we're here to see what God actually says about some things. And so that's what we have to ask ourselves. Do we really want to see, God, what is it you say? What is it you're instructing? What is it your design and purpose? Or are we going to hold on to our views as if we could not possibly be wrong? If you have a God that you cannot disagree with, that's an idol. And really, it's just something that you shape that really allows you to be God. And so... Um, the bottom line issue really with this and any other passage is, is Jesus Lord? And I don't have to know everything about every issue before I'll decide whether I'll, you know, submit or obey that. You know, just take baptism. We're talking about baptism, for example. I don't have to know or understand everything about baptism. All I have to know is Jesus commanded me to be baptized. And he's Lord. End of story. But someone's bound to say, well, this passage is, isn't going to push us back into that, that old chauvinistic patriarchy. No, I think the truth is that, is that sin has distorted really the beauty of just the complementary harmony, a really a sacrificial love union of two servants that God has designed. And I think most of you have just never seen this lived out. In fact, I think the only place you're going to see this perfectly lived out is in the life and person of Jesus. But to start with, we can clearly say this. Submission is a godly characteristic. We see it shine brightly in and from Jesus. And you can have a great flourishing marriage. You just have to die to yourself. And that's because self-centeredness is really the main problem. It's, it's the main cancer. It's the main enemy in any marriage. And so I'm talking about your self-centeredness too, not the self-centeredness of the other person, though that's also there. But this ability really to enter into a body, whether it's made up of two individuals who are coming together into a one flesh marriage union, or whether that's a number of individuals coming together in union to be part of a church body, 
but to just no longer be self-absorbed and to, to choose your own rights first, but rather to serve and actually put the good of the whole over self, that's not something that's instinctive. It's not something that's just natural, yet it's something that's absolutely assumed as the foundation of marriage. And so for this, we do need the Holy Spirit's empowering. And it's the same Holy Spirit, think about this, who actually, his delight is submissively serving and working for the glory of Jesus. This is the same Holy Spirit who condescends to indwell us. And despite our neglect of him, actually to serve in us and to gift us and to work in and through us for our good. And so real hope begins if just one person says, yeah, the main problem in my marriage, it's not my past, it's not my wounds, it's not my needs, it's, it's not this other person and, and what they're doing to me. I'm going to work on my selfishness. And in fact, if both of you do that, the possibilities are endless. Spirit generated selflessness is not thinking less of yourself, nor is it thinking more of yourself. It's actually thinking of yourself less. It's taking your mind off yourself and actually realizing that in Jesus, all your needs are going to be met or are being met, so you don't have to look to that other person to be your savior, nor do you end up self-absorbed. So the passage starts, verse 1, then 1 Peter 3, likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands. So likewise, what's that mean? Well, in the same way. So with this same attitude and heart of humility, because if you remember, he's been talking about various relationships and earthly institutions from governments and authority, um, these structures that God has set up, first of all, to reveal himself and also to, to keep order. And so likewise, and in the same way, marriage is an earthly institution that God has set up to reveal himself and to provide stability and order. And so there's a leadership component that God has given the husband to play in the home. Now, this does not say women submit to men, right? This is talking about a specific covenant marriage relationship. Notice he says there, your own husbands. So to be subject to, to submit, is to place yourself under. Actually, it's a military term, to place yourself under. And this whole idea is rooted in God. It's rooted in the triune nature of our God, where you have equality but difference in roles. I mean, this is how God is, right? There's a submission in the Trinity. There's one God um, manifest in a community of three persons, and you've got Jesus. We'll look at him in particular. He's subject to the Father in everything. He said, I only do what my Father tells me to do. So equal in essence, but different in roles. Therefore, we can say this, that that wives are not told to be subject because they're inferior. There's just no hint of that in the passage. In fact, it's outright denied because Peter says when you get to verse 7, he says to the husbands, your wives are heirs with you of the grace of life. They're equal in, in essence of this and, and of the promises and privileges of salvation, right? We're joint heirs together. And so there's no hint of inferiority. And you say, well, what about that line in the, there about them being the weaker vessel? Well, doesn't that imply inferiority? Uh, no, I don't think that's what that means, but we'll look at that in just a minute. And you might say, wives, you might say, well, the guy I'm married to, he doesn't deserve my submission. But that's not the point. It's got nothing to do with whether your husband brought you flowers. It, it has to do with Jesus' command. And so your husband may not deserve your submission. In fact, un it's unlikely he does, but Jesus does. And Peter talked about our life being spiritual sacrifices. Paul mentions that in Romans 12 as well. So you're to think of your submission to your husband really as an offering to Jesus. And it even extends to, we see in verse 1, to the unbelieving husband. Right? He continues, he says, So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And so here's how they can be one without a word. And I don't think that means absolute, right? I don't think that's forbidding her not to talk, and I don't think it's forbidding her not to talk about Jesus, right? But I think the context suggests without a nagging or a manipulative or a dishonoring word. 
Because earlier, Peter's told us that no one is born again apart from the word of the gospel. But your main weapon, right, your main focus is what he says in verse 2, and then the Christ-like character, verses 3 to 6, that he's going to get to. So verse 2 says, here's that focus, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So there's a genuine respect and humility, this, this pure, undiluted um, conduct. It's not mixed. It's, it's pure. In other words, it's not to manipulate, but actually has the motive of something that's genuine, to genuinely love him, even as Jesus loved her. Now, we see also that there's not a promise there, right? It says, it says maybe one. So it has the, indicates the possibility, and it does show that her ultimate desire really, though, is for him to see him know Jesus because that's out of a genuine love for his very best. And so before we go on, I think we should note the instructions to husbands in verse 7. He says there in verse 7, he says, give honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. There, there's that difficult phrase, right? Now, this is not weaker in terms of intelligence or even capabilities for leadership or wisdom. The commentators I read really gave three kind of areas to which they said it would refer, potentially. So the first one they said is being uh, physically weaker. Because the word vessel is used all over the Bible and it refers to the human body. So generally speaking, most husbands can overpower their wives. Now, I've seen a few of you girls could possibly give your husband a run for their money. But, but generally speaking, so generally speaking, men are physically more powerful than their wives unless you're married to Rhonda Rusi. You know, or, or who beat her? It was uh, Holly Holmes, yeah. But, but so generally weaker in the physical sense. The second thing that the commentators pointed out was secondly was that they're weaker in their position of authority because he's just going to spend here even six verses to explain that wives are to be subject to their husbands. So positionally, that puts women in the weaker position role-wise. And then thirdly, some say that it includes weaker in terms of emotional sensitivity, and what they're trying to say, I think, is that simply is that girls are wired differently than guys. And it goes beyond just our plumbing. So you've got both men and women as vessels. And so we say guys are like a tin cup. Girls are like a wine goblet. Which is better? Well, neither, right? I mean, they both can carry liquid to quench your thirst, both can accomplish that task, but they're different. So both of them are vessels, but you don't treat them exactly the same way. And so you can take the tin cup to work, right? You toss it in the back of the truck, gets a few dents, that's fine, but you don't do that with the glass goblet because it's weaker, it's more fragile, it's, it's valuable, it's precious. Or maybe we can think of it this way. Think of the difference between a Jeep and a Lamborghini, right? Jeep. Hit a few potholes, right? No big deal. Take it off road. If it gets beat up, it gets a little dirty, who cares? You kind of like it that way. Who wants their Jeep to smell like lilacs anyway? And so <laughs> girls, though, Lamborghini, right? You don't take it off roading. Keep it on the pavement. It's well-crafted. got nice lines. And so you see there's the difference. And I think I've also heard the one about it's waffles and spaghetti, right? Waffles, because the guys can compartmentalize things in their square. They're only function in one square at a time. But ladies are like the spaghetti where everything is touching everything else. It's all connected in some way. So no matter what illustration you try to use, the point is what they're trying to say is we're wired differently if you haven't figured that out. Once you've been married for a while, you've figured that out. So maybe that pic, yeah, we got the pic there up there now. Okay. There you can see the male and female control panels, okay? Now, studies have actually shown that boy babies, when they come up to an obstacle, the tendency is they want to push it over and keep on going. Whereas girl babies tend to either walk around it or maybe even use it for something else with other things that happen to be around. Who teaches them that? I mean, boy babies prefer this lower complexity of stimuli, right? I mean, they're off or on. 
right? And yet girl babies prefer this high complexity of stimuli. And so because women tend to look at things more holistically, and everything is connected. And that means that women can pick up things that guys are truly oblivious to. And sometimes, wives, you think your husbands are just acting dense? You think that's just a game? No, they are that dense. <laughs> and they really don't notice that. And you really do have to be that blunt to them. They don't get it. You go, well, they shouldn't understand they get that. No, you're thinking like a woman with all everything connected. This guy is in another compartment altogether, and he does not see that at all. Just for example, let's say I'm having a bad day, maybe even a bad day with Cheryl. And I just think, well, let's have sex, and then we can forget about it and start over, right? But that's not how she works, right? See, for husbands, sex is like a way to deal with a bad day. But for wives, sex is like the topping on a Sunday, right? There has to be a lot of sweetness building up to it because, or else she's just going to throw me the pillow and tell me that the spare bedroom is no longer empty. I won't tell you if that's a true story. <laughs> it might incriminate me. But, but for this day, we are created differently, and so we need each other. We need each other. In the Genesis creation story, the woman even there, you know, is created. And, and, and the sexual differences we see are created before the fall, before sin corrupted them. So there could be this complementary, harmonious unity, two different, bringing together something that together makes, makes better. And so we see that. And in that, that Genesis account, we've got the woman being termed as the helper, the helper, the helpmeet. And, but think about it. That's a term that God uses of himself, especially the Holy Spirit. And it implies then that Eve has resources that Adam doesn't have but needs. Just like when a student comes to me to get some help with their algebra, right? Me being their helper doesn't make me inferior, or the Holy Spirit as my helper doesn't make the Holy Spirit inferior. Believe me. So Peter, he describes then the, the wife as this weaker vessel. And what's he say? Honor her. And honor means to prioritize her, to prefer her, put her needs first. So guys, here's the point. Use your position of strength your any position of authority that you have to serve her, not yourself. So men, instead of using your strength to dominate or to maybe intimidate, use whatever strength you have to honor her, to care for her, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, to, to nourish and cherish her. And so this is not about power, it's about service. In the kingdom of Jesus, leaders are always called to be servant leaders who give themselves away for the benefit of others, not seeking to be served. That's not how Jesus came. And by the way, husbands are never told to demand submission from his wife. Right? The wife may be told to submit, but the husband's never to demand that's hers to give, not his to demand. Because the Bible never calls husbands to rule their wives over and over because it says, love your wives. And so if you put it all together, we can see then that men, you should never lead independent of your wife. Because you weren't given this role because you're able to make better decisions. For many of you men, you don't make better decisions. And your wife was given to you as a gift of God to keep you from your own stupidity. Amen? <laughs> it's, you know, it's really rare any time that my wife and I don't talk, don't pray, and don't come to some consensus. But when we do disagree, even after we pray and we'll talk about it, and if we still can't come to a consensus on something, then I know, I know here from this, I have to decide. And I have to decide thinking of the best interests of the family. For example, date night. 
and we can't decide where we're going to go eat. We have a conflict. She wants salad. Always wants salad. Right? I want pizza. So we can't seem to come together on that, right? We're not going to reach a consensus on this. So it's easy. I have to make the decision. We go for salad. Honor. Honor her. Prefer her, right? Colors in the house. The only thing I ask her, please don't paint everything pink. Right? But I should love her in such a way, I should lead her in such a way that submission to me is a blessing to her. Submission, though, also implies disagreement, right? In other words, it's not submission when you agree on something already. That's called agreement. Submission really comes in when there is not agreement, okay? And my wife can put the pressure on me to be the man, right? Or she just says, you know, well, this is what I think. You know what I think. But you have to make the decision and answer to God for it. And that forces me to man up. Right? Because I can't just hide in the group where, where nobody's really responsible. I have to own it. To be the head is to bear that responsibility. It's to take responsibility. And so spiritual leadership is not license to do what you want to do. It's empowerment to do what you ought to do for the good of those you serve. You can tweet that one. Right? Need to repeat it? Spiritual leadership is not licensed to do what you want to do, but empowerment to do what you ought to do for the good of those you serve. You know, there's only a handful of times, really, that I can think of in our 36 years of marriage where Cheryl had to submit to me, where we had a time limit and we just could not come to an agreement. But in those times of disagreement, she submitted, and she gave me, really, the responsibility for the decision. And for better or for worse, just like we promised, right, in the grace of God, right, I tried to, I sought to make the best decision for our family for the long term and not just for me. Because it's, it's all about imaging forth the beauty, really, of our servant king, which is what verse 3 and following is getting in, that section of the scripture. Where in verse 3, we, we read here, it's instructing the wives. It says, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's a term used of Jesus several times in the Gospels, which is in God's sight is very precious, very Jesus-like. Now, some fundamentalists use this to say that this is a prohibition against braiding of the hair, putting on gold jewelry, but I don't think this can be because there's a third thing on the list. You see it? Right? Because then it would also mean not wearing clothes. Right? So these are not absolutes. Right? Any more than speaking words in verse 1 was an absolute. But winning your non-Christian husband to Jesus is not by doing what the world says to do, which is to manipulate and control. The world tells you to be beautiful. The focus is on external beauty and clothing, right? That's what gives you power and significance. But Peter says there's a beauty that's sweeter and better. It's Jesus kind of beauty. And the good thing about this beauty is it doesn't fade And it's imperishable. You see, back then, women were treated like property, like commodities, where her looks is what gave her her value, how things have changed. But what Jesus says through Peter is really countercultural. And he's not saying, women, just let yourselves go. You know, you need to look really drab and frumpy, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about legalistic rules here at all. Rather, he's trying to say that this is not your main priority. Don't let your life be defined by your body image. Don't let your life be defined by your clothing, your body image. You're a daughter of God. It's being restored to Jesus and reflecting his character. 
from the heart so that others actually can see Jesus' greatness and know him. I mean, even if you think this, I mean, even take this idea. Take a, a, a wife, and she's had three, four, maybe more children, right? And there she's laying by her husband, right? She's laying on her side, and then laying next to her is kind of her tummy, right? From having three, four more babies. That husband should look, and that should be a beauty to him because this woman gave her life and her body to serve you and your family, to help your family reproduce and have these children. That should be a beauty of a servant heart. That should be a Christ-like beauty to you that goes beyond anything just on the outside and how she looks in tight pants. So because of the resurrection, you have an imperishable beauty growing in you that exudes from within, and it'll go on forever. So you don't need to build your identity and your hope on how you look. In verses 5, where he, told, he, he directs the, the wife to hope in God. And that's what makes you like Sarah of old, um, fearless, right? And so you, you have that. And this all comes about that you end up manifesting what it says in verse 4, this gentle and quiet or tranquil spirit of confidence, right? That gentle, tranquil spirit flows out of a confidence in your covenant-keeping God, which allows you to be bold and a courageous woman in the midst of tough situations, difficult circumstances, and that actually starts to become noticeable so that even her husband may ask her for a reason of the hope that lies within her. And so, listen to this. It's her confidence then is not that she knows she looks good, though she may, but her confidence is in Jesus and his steadfast love. And note that it says a gentle and tranquil spirit, not personality. He's not getting at the external, right? There are people with quiet and introverted personalities that are angry and self-absorbed behind closed doors. And loud personalities, praise God, right, can have this spirit because it's a submissive spirit to Jesus and to his kingdom purposes flowing out of her trust in him. So husbands, likewise, verse 7, have this same attitude. It's not saying you've got the same role or giving you the exact same instructions, but you have the same root attitude of humble selflessness that truly loves from a pure heart. That's the same. And you'll have a fearlessness and a confidence that comes from what he had said earlier, a hope in God. And he says, live with your wife in an understanding way. So I think he's getting, you, you have to know her. You've got to get to know her so that you can love her and serve her well. And not just know her, right, but to live in light of this. So each of us guys who are married, we have a different wife. And there are generalities to be sure, but each one is unique. And so you have to get to know your wife. See, that's the main problem with many marriage books. They tell you how to love the author's wife right? But I'm not married to their wife. I need to get to know my wife. And to truly love your wife, you must also get to know Jesus and understand his love for you and live in light of that knowledge. So both sexes really have the privilege of playing out the Jesus role in the marriage. You've got wives submit, just like Jesus submitted to the father. The son submits to the father's headship, with just this free, voluntary, and joyful eagerness, not out of coercion, not out of inferiority, the son taking on this subordinate role actually shows not his weakness, actually shows his greatness. When he's washing feet, when he's washing disciples' feet, is that showing his inferiority, or is that showing his greatness? When he's on the cross, is that showing his inferiority, or is that showing his greatness? And then husbands, you're also to play out the Jesus role, right? Loving your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
Paul writes in Ephesians 5, right? Laying down your life for your wife, sacrificially and for her good. So wives, you submit. Husbands, you die. And the effects. Three results when you live this way. We've got to hurry because of time, but men, when you honor your wives, your prayers are not hindered. That's a pretty drastic statement, right? That your prayers to God are hindered when you're out of step with your wife. And the idea is this, I think. When you approach God in prayer, presumably it's because you need something, right? God gets glory in this. He's the giver. We ask or we need of him. He gets glorified. So, but prayer really is from this position of powerlessness. And so men... If you've used your position of power in your marriage to serve yourself and not your wife, then why would you think God would use his position of power to serve you? So the gospel is about God who is strong, using his position, though, to serve the weak. So those who believe the gospel should become like the gospel, which means we show the change by using our position always to serve the weaker. And that just shows that also the absolute need of prayer for this gospel mission that Peter's talking about to go forward, to which we're called. The second thing we see as a result of living life this way is that you're actually enabled to live together. Verse 7, so many marriages are just roommate situations. You get two separate lives when they don't put this into practice. And that's not what you hoped for when you got married, and it's not what God wants for your marriage either. The third thing is we can win a cynical world. Peter says to the wives, when you submit this way, for Jesus' sake, your husbands may be won through showing off the beauty of Jesus. So our marriages ought to be one of the most convincing apologetics or arguments for our cynical world. So how might we change our spouse? Not through nagging or overpowering them. Jesus changed us by serving us in grace, laying down his life in self-sacrificing love, and that's how we change the hearts of both our spouse and a watching, cynical world. Do we have any questions? Just one. Wow. Is there a submissive way to apply reverse psychology? That's a really good question. Next? There isn't a next one? No. (laughs) Yeah. I'll let you ponder that. I said you could ask questions. I didn't say you'd get an answer. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'd have to really think about that. The key word, I guess, is genuine, keeps coming out of with a pure, right? That pure is what he's after, that genuine love, and what most genuine. And so I think that I think the instructions to live out is not necessarily trying to use reverse psychology in a way of love, but simply following what he's given us in these first seven verses. Well, if you're here and you're single and you're feeling left out, kind of like chopped liver, don't forget this. Singleness is a high calling. Jesus was single, and he was the most satisfied, most fulfilled, God-glorifying person who ever walked the earth. So single people, please don't feel incomplete around married people. Paul was single as well. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 7, he considered marriage a coping mechanism for those who can't hack it. Right? But if the gospel is true, then you already have a spouse. And he's already vowed, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then all you have to do is just, wow, fall in and vow back. Because he's already been at the altar and he's laid himself on it. And there he said, with all that I am, with all that I have, I give myself to you, right? To be there for you, to bring you home. And he's made the vow. And Christianity says every individual who makes a vow back has the only spouse you really need. 
the only spouse who can really bring you home. No human spouse is ever going to satisfy you like Jesus. And he's the one spouse you really need. And he's available to anyone, married or unmarried. So whether you're married or not, when we come to the Lord's table here, we see that our pride and our self-centeredness can only be dealt with through the gospel of Jesus. Because it's the gospel that says you're more wicked than you ever dared acknowledge, but you're more loved and accepted in Jesus than you ever dared hope. And that just does a one-two on your ego. So the person who thinks too much of himself, you're more wicked than you believe. The person who thinks too little of himself or herself, you're more loved than you ever dared hope. And the two kinds of self-centeredness that are, I'm so wonderful or I'm so awful, both of which make it impossible for you to truly serve other people, but they're both destroyed at the foot of the cross. If you want to deal with the problem, just come to him now. Jesus created us. And then Genesis says we turned away from him. We went away from him. What did Jesus do? Did he say, well, you're not being the spouse you should be. So I'm not going to be the spouse that I could be. No, he came to earth. He emptied himself. He went to the cross. He gave himself for us. Husbands, wives, look at how Jesus loved us and gave himself for us in the ultimate spousal love. And when he was up on that cross, looking down at us for being terrible spouses, killing him, betraying him, denying him, mocking him, in one of the great acts of spousal love in history, he stayed. And he spoke the truth in love to us. He didn't leave us. And through that death comes resurrection. And if you know he loves you like that, if the Holy Spirit just brings that home to your heart, you'll love him. And you'll find the love that you're longing for. And if you love God more than your spouse, then you'll love your spouse well. And if your spouse is the main source of love in your life, you will not love your spouse well. And human love, it's all meant to be a pointer to the love of Jesus. So Holy Spirit, help us.